The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. joining us. Dive Heart is an amazing 501c3 that teaches scuba diving and social skills to differently abled folks, including those who are on the autism spectrum, with some pretty amazing results. So we're going to welcome them a little bit later on in the hour. If you are watching right now uh, and want to know if we are live, today is the 8th of February. Uh, it is 2023. That still doesn't roll trippingly off the tongue. Uh, and we are uh, live here today on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and about a dozen other sites. Traven will start to run through those for you in just a second, any moment now. And you guys can take a look at all the different ways that you can be watching the show, including Spotify and iHeartRadio and all those other ways. We are live. We try to uh, give you programming at a very set time, Monday through Friday, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern time. Please do the math. Uh, they're saying it's still very low volume for them, uh, Traven. So um, we try to uh, be live Monday through Friday at least once a day. Oh, Michelle says it's much better now. Okay. And, uh, but then we podcast, and we are available as a free, po free download wherever you get your podcasts. And so you can check us out. But not only can you check out today's show, but you could check out the last 12 years. Uh, I, that is shocking to me that we've been doing this in some way or shape or form for over 12 years now, but it's true. And we have a plethora of videos. And when we do the jargon of today, I'm, I'm going to tell you a funny story about that because I told my husband last night, we truly have reached the end of the universe. Cause sometimes when I want to refresh your course about the topic that we're talking about, you know, I will go and look at, you know, some things online and I'll, I'll Google and I'll see what else <laughs> other people are. But more often than not now, when I Google it, one of our videos comes up. So last night, I watched a fascinating um, talk that I, that I, you know, I wasn't doing the talking, but Dr. Adele Nadowski was talking about exactly our jargon today. And that's what came up when I Googled PRT and put in a video, because I like to watch a good video. I don't know about you. I like to read things, too, but a good video, sometimes I can be doing other things while I'm watching the video. And I can multitask, right? And there it was, Autism Live. I don't remember what year it was, but it was many a moon ago. And a great video that's still relevant today and that helped sharpen my focus a little bit on PRT and what it is, because I think my mind has changed significantly about PRT. We're going to talk about that in a second. But don't forget that you can be watching us in podcast. We really look forward to interacting with you when you're live. Uh, so especially if you're on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, you can be writing in right now like Michelle is. Good morning, Michelle. Um, uh, but you can also email me uh, if you have a longer question or something you want to ask Dr. Doreen, for instance, you can email me. My email is shannon at autism-live.com. I do want to say, too, for those of you who listen in podcasts, it might be fun, I don't know, it might be trippy, to head over to YouTube and watch the video podcast when we have our guests on because uh, that's super fun. I also want to say that I was woken very early this morning. I, when I get a call at like 6.15, I always know who it's going to be, Temple Grandin. Um, because uh, she's up early, and she knows that generally I'm up early. So uh, Temple called me, and we set her time during the Autism Network podcast-a-thon. So she'll be joining us on April 4th. Uh, I think it's the fourth hour that we're in, our 44-hour podcast journey. Information and inspiration extravaganza, as I call it, subtitled, where we're going to be live. We're going to attempt to be live for 40 Four hours. Obviously, I can't be here for 44 hours and be able, I, like I'm struggling to be able to find verbiage this morning. So there will be other people who will step in and host, and we have other organizations that we're partnering with, and we're lining up the creme de la creme of the guests. Obviously, Dr. Grandin is uh, 
locked in for it will be 7 p.m. on the night of the 4th, April 4th, which also happens to be the day that her new book comes out that really focuses on education, which I'm so excited about and was really thrilled to talk with her about that this morning. I also want to say, too, one of the things that Temple and I were talking about this morning, I know that last night was the State of the Union address, and I, I had some other things going on, so I didn't catch the entire thing. I caught, like, you know, the last part of it. And um, I also had been invited, to, sometimes they, for press, they have things that you can go to a thing beforehand, to, you know, hear, like, in detail. And I was invited to several of those yesterday that I was unable to attend. But w the one that I would have wanted to attend that had to do with our community is that there's a new program called Ticket to Work. And it is designed to help those who are differently abled, um, who might be struggling to find unemployment, which, you know, that's our community, um, to be able to fast track them to employment. There is a, a, a upcoming webinar that I'm hoping to be able to attend and then give you guys more information about that. But, you know, I was talking with Temple about that and we were both very excited uh, to see what that is. I don't have many more details except that that's the, the goal of this program. So I look forward uh, to finding out more and coming back to you guys with that. All right. Uh, okay. I do like to remind you at the start of the show on Wednesday that we have many experts on the show. I'm not one of them. I'm a proud pony, a parent of a neurodiverse individual. And so I, it is very important to me that I help you. And uh, we expect that our audience is that larger autism community. Of course, that there are individuals who are on the autism spectrum. They are the heart of our community. They're our big why, right? Why we do all the things that we do because we want to be good allies with them and for them to help them to be able to do all the things that they want to do and are important to them in their lives, correct? Uh, but we also include in that community everyone who loves those individuals, everyone who wants to be supportive, who wants to be a good ally. And I count myself in that category. Uh, I'm always striving to be firmly in that category. Let's face it, sometimes you think you're helping and, you know, you can get off track. Uh, I don't want to say that I'm perfect as an ally, but I want to say that I'm constantly wanting to sit in the front row and raise my hand first and ask questions and listen, 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 listen. Okay, uh, so that's our disclaimer. Now it's time to move on to our jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey, nani, nani, are those experts talking about? What does it have to do with us? Why do we care? Why do I have to learn this new term? I just want to throw knives sometimes, right? And I got to be honest, this term, I think when we went over this the first time, probably 10 years ago, I was like, what? Why does this term even exist? I think I got a little better beat on it 10 years later and, and have more to say this time. So let's take a look. First, we're going to give you the actual definition. A lot of times I make fun of the actual definition because it doesn't get us any closer to understanding what the what it really is going to mean to us. But then we give you a working definition, which is less exact, sometimes makes the experts a little fatutzed, but hopefully it helps you to know what this thing is to see whether it's something you want to bother with. And then I try to put it into some form of context for you so that you have a beginning understanding. If you still don't get it, don't sweat it. It may not be your time yet to get it. You may not be there, uh, but you will eventually. And sometimes these terms take a little bit of time. Be patient with yourself. We didn't come out of our own, the womb of our mother with a degree in psychology. Leastways, I didn't. And I don't know anybody who did. Maybe you're different. It could have happened. Uh, okay, just kidding. Let's take a look. Our term today is PRT. What does that stand for? Uh, pivotal Response Training. Let's take a look at our actual definition and see if we can make heads or tails of this. I don't remember it as being too bad. Pivotal response training, a variation of applied behavior analysis, ABA. You got to give it back to me, Traven, because I don't have it memorized. Uh, is it coming back? It's left. Um, okay. I don't, <laughs> I don't know when it'll come back, but let's talk about it. It is a, considered derivative of um, 
let's go back to the other one. I didn't get to finish reading it. A variation of applied, thank you, applied behavior analysis uh, type therapy. It focuses on more comprehensive pivotal areas such as increasing a child's motivation to learn, initiate co uh, communication, and monitor their, their own behaviors. Um, and I, I love how we sort of dance around that it's a type of ABA therapy and that it and we get to the, it focuses on comprehensive pivotal. Oh, great. Well, if I know what pivotal means in, as it relates to my child learning, then I don't need you to, you know what I mean? Uh, hmm. Drives me crazy when we repeat things. Let, <laughs> it's just slide it into the ocean. Now let's take a look at our working definition, which is a little bit long, but I wanted to put a lot of stuff in. It's also, uh, it's a naturalistic type of therapy. It focuses on more comp. No, I need the next one now, Trayvon. <laughs> there we go. Uh, what I think what's important here is that the people who coined this term and really developed the tools around this very specific PRT are Robert and Lynn Cagle out of UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and it's, it was designed to provide a more naturalistic approach to the principles of ABA. This therapy is considered play-based and initiated by the child. PRT is based on the principles of applied behavior analysis. Okay, round and round we go. All right, so are you confused? I would be. Um, and I was. Let me be honest about this. And maybe I still am a little bit. Um, I remember the first time somebody talked to me about this and they're like, oh, it's so different from ABA. Uh, it's it's child-driven, and it takes into consideration, it doesn't just start teaching them everything. The, what, the reason why they call it pivotal is what are the things that are pivotal to the child being successful? Well, you know, the truth of the matter is that there are some skills that if you don't have them, it's not going to be pivotal to you being successful, right? So let's focus on the things that are pivotal. Like if the child is motivated to learn, well, there's going to be a whole much so much more that they can learn. So that's pivotal. The child being able to understand language and communicate their needs, well, that's pivotal, right? So we should definitely teach that. The child understanding social cues in the community, um, you know, like when somebody points, you know, and looks at you, that that means to go and say, well, that's pretty pivotal, right? Understanding, um, you know, gestures and things like that. All of these things are pretty pivotal. So let's start with those things because they're the most meaningful to the child. And the other thing that PRT does is it says it has to be fun and rewarding for the kids, and they um, and the rewards have to be truly rewarding enough to make doing you know, this hard thing worthwhile. So if you watch the show at all, you're probably going, wait a second, that sounds exactly the way Shannon describes ABA. And herein lies what my confusion always was with PRT. And one of the things that I was told early on uh, was that, you know, well, people, ABA is a, you know, a, t a toolkit. It's like a paintbrush kit. And you have all these paintbrushes and you can do it in all different kinds of ways. And some people, you know, lean a little bit more the PRT way. And, uh, and I was like, oh, okay, but aren't we supposed to use like all the paintbrushes depending on what the child needs? So I kind of, I, I won't say that I dismissed PRT, but I thought of it at more as um, I love the Kegels. I mean, their book was one of the first books that I ever got. It's on my bookcase over here. Um, so I love the Kegels, and I've, I've had the opportunity to speak on the same stage with Lynn Kegel. I, I, she's a hero to me, you know. I, I am in no way poo-pooing, and I think that they really took the tools of ABA and said, here's how we want to do it, and we're going to brand this in a way that people understand when we're talking about it what we're talking about, and um, that we're doing PRT. And, uh, and I respect and admire that completely. And, but I really thought of it that way. I was like, oh, they're branding, you know, that they're doing it this very specific way. And I guess the difficulty that I had with it was my child was having a lot of PRT in his ABA program, so I didn't see why we needed to have a different name for it. Now, can I tell you, I think we need a different name for all of it because <laughs> You guys know how much I struggle here when we're talking about ABA, and when I talk about, when I say ABA, all kinds of things come into people's minds, preconceived notions of it's this, it's this, it's this, and I might be saying something that in my head is orange, but somebody is picturing green in their head. 
Um, and you know, there have been people for a long time saying, I think you should stop using the term ABA because it's so um, incendiary for people. people it's, it's a trigger that people have such a reaction to it. And I kind of respect and admire that Lynn Cagle kind of carved out her thing and said, here's what I think are the good aspects of ABA, and I'm going to focus on them. Here's where I have an issue, OK? That I, I think people who are drawn to the field of behavior analysis are people who are very, they love their data, love that about them, but they tend to see things in kind of black and white categories. Whereas as a parent, I see it as a much more gray area, right? Um, and I'm looking at that thing of that paintbrush uh, toolkit and seeing an individual. And so the individual says, you know, uh, I need this. And so you pull out this paintbrush and you go, let's use this one together and let's see how this goes. Oh, you know what? Maybe we should try this one now. Try this one. And oh, you'd li you like that? Oh, then you know what? You'll really like this one. Um, and, and I always say that uh, good ABA has to be child-led and there has to be an element of play and it has to be reinforcing. But when it comes to, and I absolutely think that we should be, if you look at what I said the, the 10 hallmarks for good ABA are, you're going to see that it's very PRT aligned um, and very heavy on the PRT. But I also don't leave out the fact that some DTT is very important. But it needs to be DTT done in the right way, teaching the right skills. Because DTT is the very formal, it's the thing that a lot of people don't love. But what's shocking to me and what I hear all over the country from parents is that you've got an ABA team that's either doing just DTT, which makes me want to scream, yell, throw things, light my hair on fire, and run screaming into the street with a hatchet, right? But ask me how I really feel, right? You can't do just DTT. It's not meant to be done just DTT, right? But then we have people on the opposite side of the thing who are just doing natural environment training, not even PRT, but just doing natural environment and calling it ABA. And I think that having a nice mix of all these things and, and looking at the individual, whether it's a child, a teen, or adult, or a senior citizen, and saying what do they need, and what do they need for this skill, and what do they need now? Well, they just learned this, so now we're going to move on to this thing, and what do we need now? You know what? That takes a little bit more thought and consideration, but it's important. I would say, though, that in today's ABA world, to parents out there who want to make sense of all this, that I would be asking questions like, are they doing pivotal response training? Because if you go online and look at some of the, they have great charts about, well, here's a way that you might teach this one way, but here's the PRT way. It's always that fair thing that Dr. Grampiche is always talking about. It's much more fair, much more exciting, uh, fun for the individual, much more meaningful for them. So if you've got somebody who's just doing DTT, will you please look for somebody else and ask the question and say, hey, is your approach more of a pivotal response uh, training uh, re re approach? And if they say yes, yeah, say, but do you sometimes teach some skills in the beginning, DTT, for a short period of time? Because I think that that's, uh, you know, or simply ask the question, but are you open to doing DTT to begin teaching a skill if that's right for the child? If somebody knows exactly what you're talking about, I think you're probably with somebody who's, who gets it. Um, but you get these people who are so entrenched. By the way, in branding the PRT, this is the other thing I absolutely think Lynn Cagle is a genius because uh, it says right in the definition of, of PRT, I didn't include it because it's too long, that um, it should only be done one-to-one -one and it should uh, be done a minimum of 25 hours. Thank you, Lynn Cagle, because so often people, when people say ABA, <coughs> excuse me, we, we just had this yesterday with somebody saying, well, we're kind of getting it at school. And doc, did you see Dr. Grampy-Shea's face? She was like, well, ABA for intensive behavioral intervention should only be one-to-one. -one. Um, but I love how schools are like, oh, we're doing ABA six-to-one ratio. And you go, <laughs> OK, let me see your manual. They don't have one. Uh, it's not the same thing as what we're talking about. Um, 
So I love that Lynn Cagle was like, oh, and PRT really to be effective has to be a minimum of 25 hours a week, and it has to be one-to-one. -one. So we're not frogging around at all. And, you know, she's got studies to show how effective it is at building communication skills. So, um, and it qualifies as ABA. So God bless Kit Lynn and um, her husband, Robert, for the work that they're doing at uh, UC uh, Santa Barbara. Pivotal response training, it's good ABA. Let's leave it at that. Okay, moving on. Uh, we've got these great guests who are joining us, and I'm a little bit late, and I apologize to them. Uh, but we've been talking about this, teasing this all week, that there's this amazing organization called Dive Heart. And so right now we're going to be joined by uh, the... <laughs> Uh, Jim El Elliott is going to be joining us, and Dive Heart Executive Director Tina Marie Hernandez is joining us. Um, and I'm going to say about Jim that he apparently had a successful career in the media business before he launched Dive Heart in, uh, I don't have which year, I thought I did. But anyway, it is a 501c3. It helps build confidence and independence in children, veterans, and others with disabilities through zero gravity and scuba therapy. Dive Heart seeks to instill the can-do spirit in its participants. Dive Heart doesn't discriminate when it comes to working with people with disabilities and serves cognitively and physically impaired individuals worldwide. Uh, since 2001, Elliot, who is a volunteer with no salary, has initiated scuba therapy research with university medical centers around the country, including the first study on autism and scuba therapy and the world's most innovative adaptive scuba, scuba training program for instructors, dive buddies, and adaptive divers. He also lectures and trains dive professionals in the business of adaptive scuba. And now, Tina Marie Hernandez, who is the executive director, she grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. She's always had a love of learning and was the first in her family to attend and graduate college. Congratulations, Tina Marie. She has always found a way to give back, be it through candy striping, uh, coaching softball, teaching swim lessons to people with disabilities, or teaching Sunday school. When asked what drew her to Dive Heart, Tina Marie responded, I grew up with a cousin who lived his life with both physical and cognitive challenges, uh, but Joey didn't let that hold him back, and I just know he would have loved scuba had he known about Dive Heart. So let's welcome Jim and Tina Marie to the show. I can't wait to talk to them about this amazing organization. So, uh, so thrilled that you guys are here. I've been talking about your amazing program. Le I want to hear from you guys. Tell us all we need to know about Dive Heart, everything from start to finish. So Dive Heart started in 2001. We're 22 years old this April. And uh, we, like you, you, you encapsulated it well early you know, when you were introducing us. You know, we work for people with disabilities and we want to show them all the, we want to highlight the abilities they do have and we want to make them proud of themselves and, and feel more independent. I think in the um, piece that you saw with Chris, she talked about that. Her parents talked about how, what a change they saw in, in becoming more independent and coming on this trip and doing stuff for herself that they never thought she was going to do. Yeah, I mean, amazing and inspirational and, and truly fabulous. Uh, I'm giving you guys your own microphone. That's what's happening right now. Um, okay. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so amazing to hear her talk about what it was doing for her and then to hear her parents talk about how you know, they were two days into a trip and, and the growth that they had seen just in the two days and, and the independence and in that motivation um, that she was interested in getting herself ready the night before uh, instead of having to be gotten ready in the morning, which I, I love the dad said, I know this doesn't seem like a big deal to other people, but we all get it. We all totally get it. Uh, really amazing. So, Jim, uh, you started this. What made you think that this was going to be what it is? 
I know. I did. I didn't think it was going to be what it is. Actually, uh, I thought it was going to be a. I had been guided and taught blind skiers for decades. My mm. oldest daughter's blind, and mm. so I saw skiing help people a lot. But I'd been diving since I was a journalism major in college, and I I knew that diving intuitively. I mean, you're in zero gravity. It's it's amazing feeling, and I knew that that if we got people out of wheelchairs and got them into water, for example, that would that would help them with range of motion and other physiological benefits not thinking that with autism the ambient pressure and increase there helps kind of like a weighted blanket or a pressure vest does and then being underwater helps um, eliminate surface triggers and distractions so now it's kind of a little bit like a sensory deprivation room helps them focus and the cool factor is off the charts so someone with with autism now is they self-identify as a diver you know what i mean and they everybody in the world's got to know their divers which is really cool and they uh before before we had digital stuff kids would carry around little picture books of um of them diving and go to, into the doctor's office and people had to see it every single time they went in it's just like oh look you have a diver so it's uh it's been very cool watching the progression on individuals with physical and cognitive um different abilities uh, embrace scuba as a uh, really as a not only a uh, recreational activity but as a therapy it's been very cool amazing and one of the things the parents brought up is that there's a whole social component to this too that to see that their kids uh, you know kids i say but they're a lot of times adults interacting with other people on the boat with the other divers with the crew on the boat with confidence and being interested and and you know and them being interested in their kids how amazing that is i love that the dad said she's found her tribe yes that was that um, when he shared that idea, that thought on a trip, it really hit me. And I think that there's a lot. What's nice is they're coming into a safe space to begin with, but the acceptance that they receive, that hopefully everyone who gets involved with us receives, is a changing factor for them. So that, you know, people who might not be accepted all the time into the various groups that they interact with. One of our goals is to have them feel accepted, and that was what the dad was sharing, and that's what we experience with a lot of people who do our programs, and we want that to happen, and we, we hope it happens every time. So talk to us a little bit about how this works, because there's going to be people who are going to watch this today and in the coming days and in the next couple of years, and they're going to go, oh, my gosh, maybe this is a thing for me or my kiddo. Where do they start? How does this progress? Do you have to live in a certain area of the world? What, what needs to happen? Well, we hope that as we continue to grow, you don't have to, you know, live in any particular part of the, the world. Right now, we are headquarters is out of the Chicagoland area. We have a number of groups that are throughout the U.S. And the first step would be, you know, contact us at info at diveheart.org. And then we could hopefully either connect you with a group that's already in existence, or we can help you find a group that could get you into a pool. The pools are where the majority of our work is done and where we introduce people to diving. And then once you've tried it in the pool, if you feel like you want to go on one of these trips, if that is what your next goal is, then we can help you get certified as an adaptive diver um, and then come on one of our trips. And we work with both verbal and nonverbal people on the spectrum, right? Uh, we've had families, what's really cool is we'll have families get involved and, you know, not only does the adaptive diver get certified, but the brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers or maybe a really close friend get certified and then they can go on these types of trips by themselves or with us. Yeah. And you guys always have a buddy when you, when you have an adaptive diver diving, there's always a buddy. Talk a little bit about who those people are and what their role is, how that works. Well, we train instructors and dive buddies all over the world um, to work with individuals with different types of abilities. And when, we, when someone comes to us, we typically will have minimally two buddies with the individual. And each of the adaptive dive buddies or instructors are very, very highly trained. And they're it's sensitive training. It's, it's, it's 
learning how to deal with individuals with different types of cognitive abilities, somebody with PTSD or, or ALS or um, autism or traumatic brain injury, and, and try to f- discover the nuance between those. And we don't try to make anybody a doctor or a therapist, but we do want them to be sensitive and identify the abilities the individual has and work with those abilities, try to understand what the triggers might be. Uh, this is where parents and caregivers come in handy, where we can kind of get a download from them. Uh, we, do, we work with individuals that are, that are nonverbal with autism, and sometimes there's hand signals that they'd be need to be used and maybe that's only a parent or a caregiver that communicate in that way so we'll have the that per individual in the water with the with their child or um and then then we'll have someone else in the water or two people in the water to help with the safety aspects of the diving because you you are underwater and you are on life support in zero gravity so it's very forgiving very cool but it's also something that needs to, it's, it's serious fun, we call it. I like that, right. serious fun. And one of the standards in diving is that you're usually diving with a buddy anyway. So yeah. it's nothing extra special in that because you always need a buddy in the water. I need a buddy. He needs a buddy. Um, that's, that's how diving works. One of the things that we've learned from the people that we've worked with um, in, on the autism spectrum is that Sometimes two people is just too much. So we've um, created, we, we've made notes for ourselves. So if we're working with someone for the first time, you might still have two people that are there to assist, but only one person is the person giving direction and standing in front of them and, and getting to know them. One of the other things that we've learned is that, um, you know, sometimes change uh throws people off. So what we always make sure we're doing is we make at every at every event we have, people have this shirt on. Hmm. The helpers have this shirt on. And so what we do is we make it so that the people that we work with who might be on the autism spectrum, if they don't really like having someone new every time, we always make sure they have a repeat person and then maybe another new person that they meet every time they come back to the pool. That way they get a comfort level with the people who wear the shirt and they know that the people who have this shirt on are people that are going to be trustworthy and someone that they can work with. And it helps expand who they can work with at Dive Heart and have, it helps us because if the person they were working with that, you know, they love and, and, and cherish and stuff, maybe they couldn't make the event, but we can still get the person in the water. So it really helps us on all ends. There are are tools we use that we've introduced to the industry. And and for example, a full face mask. So if an individual uh, can't hold or won't hold a regulator in their mouth, we use a full face mask. And that allows, that way water won't get on their face at all. So that's a, it's an amazing tool. It allows a lot of people with a lot of different types of disabilities to, um, to dive. And for, for your audience, I would I would say that a really easy way to find out what we do, and I believe being a media guy, a picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah. If you went to our, our YouTube channel and clicked on playlist, you would get all the, the medical stories and military stories and the fun stories and the major features and documentaries, and, and parents can share, sit down and share that with their children and, and say, hey, look, do you think this is something you might want to do? And then we have we train instructors all over the world. So, for example, if you were going down to the Keys, we have people in the Keys that we could connect you with, where now they could take you in a pool or they could take you on a dive and give you that experience um, while you're on vacation or something like that. Well, you just made Joanne's uh, dreams come true because she had written in and said, does this work if we're on vacation and want to drive and want to dive? Uh, amazing. Talk to us a little bit about, like, is there an age range that kids should be a certain age range to, to start to try this? We, we start um, at 10 years old, okay. uh, mainly because of the squirrel factor. You know, younger kids, well, getting them into gear that fits them. And then also um, there are some, like, the number one rule in diving is you can't hold your breath. So with anyone that we're working with when we get them at first in the pool is we need to make sure that we know that that person isn't going to hold their breath while they're underwater. Okay. Even when you're in, in shallow water, it is still the, the number one rule. So, Which is the like opposite that. rule when you're sticking your head underwater when you're swimming. 
uh, which might be hard. Uh, I could see where that would be confusing. I would probably have a hard time with this. Do we also need to be concerned about if kids have had ear infections? Is this maybe not the best thing for them? Or is there any kind of an ear thing that we should be? Well, what we do is we ask every person who wants to um, get in the water with us to talk with their medical you know, person, the, the doctor that they work with that knows them the best, not just any doctor, but the person that knows them the best, knows their condition. And there's a, a paperwork that they fill out to make sure that it's a safe activity for them. Okay. There are conditions that maybe would keep them from diving that we wouldn't know about, that they might not even know about, okay. that the doctor would. Okay. Um, one of the conditions I know, like if, if someone um, is prone to having seizures or is on seizure medication, we cannot get them into the water. It's too dangerous. Okay. All right. um, At this time, maybe in the future. On the issue of ears, though, we work with an organization called Divers Alert Network, and it's physicians that are on call 24-7 for any kind of a medical question that you have. Oh. And they will, they're will they dive physicians, so they're not just an ENT that can help you with your ear issue, but they, they understand the concepts of diving and pressure and what's involved. So um, we can, uh, the Divers Alert Network, it's called DAN, uh, okay. and we can turn people on to that organization, and they can say, hey, Johnny has tubes in his ears. Is that something that he can dive with? Right. They do also have masks where there's a tube that goes from the, the, the enclosed area of the mask in the nose. The tube goes to the ear, and then there's a, a cup over the ear so it doesn't get water on the ear. So there are tools out there that people can use that have ear issues that uh, can be you know employed as well. I love this. And so how often do you guys plan a trip to go someplace? We take between four and six trips a year. Okay. So typically we're, we're going in the spring, summer, fall, winter, um, and then we throw some different locations in. And, um, and we're, we're constantly trying to find new places that we can go and expand the world of adaptive diving for people. When COVID hit, we canceled 14 trips and 200 pool programs around the country. Oh. Um, and the difference between the pool the pool programs we do for free and then the trips, we try to figure out how to jointly fundraise on those trips. So, for example, if you had a child and wanted to come on a trip or you wanted to come and learn to be a buddy, we, teach, we treat our trips just like a church mission trip. So if you went to Ecuador to put a roof on a school, for example, with your church, you would go down and you would pay your way, get down there, pay your way. And we negotiate the best price we can with the dive operator in the resort. And then you go, wow, Jim, I can come up with 80% of this um, on my own and locally fundraising in my neighborhood. But can you help? And then we reach back and, and look at grants we have and scholarships and ways that we can jointly fundraise. Facebook is a, is a great example. They don't charge fees. And we say set up a dive, uh, Facebook fundraiser for Dive Heart and we'll earmark that for you. And then what you do is you just go out and share it. We'll share it with all our people. And now, you know, Johnny, who's on the spectrum, can come on that trip with his family, right? So it's, it's kind of a creative way that we work together with people that want to participate and um, and figure out how to get them on a trip. Amazing. Uh, absolutely amazing. And did I hear you just say that the pool program is free? Mm -hmm. Pool programs are always free, and um, they can come as many times as they want. That's crazy. So give us the website again, because now everybody wants to find those 20 programs around the country that you got going on. Uh, tell us, Tell us what your website is. It's uh, diveheart.org, www.diveheart.org. There it is, right on the T-shirt, you guys, diveheart.org. I also noticed, Jim, you're a media guy. I noticed that the footage, you know, I, anytime you can go underwater with a good camera, it's, it's a good time, right? There's some amazing footage that you guys have. And you just said something about a documentary. Have you guys done a documentary? We've had a couple done, actually. Um, there's a couple different ways to see what we've done media-wise. One is at diveheart.org. You can click on the media kit. Now, the media kit, uh, the, the study we did with Midwestern University on autism and school therapy, that's in the media kit in the middle, in the medical component there. We have military and medical stories and the media kit. But then also going to the YouTube channel and clicking on a playlist will give you different categories if you want to you know, look at medical. You 
want to look at uh, military, you want to look at documentaries. Under major features and documentaries, though, on our playlist, we do have um, almost everything we've done. The latest documentary called Adapting to Dive. When you go to diveheart.org, it pops right up. You can get to it on Amazon or on Tubi TV through the, the website or just Google it and find and find it right away. But that is not in our in our media kit or our playlist now because it's available on Amazon still and the yeah. filmmaker has to has to make he has to, yeah. you know that's his his royalty. But um it has won nine international film festival awards since it began. And on that trip we do have individuals on the on the spectrum. And then there's another piece that is uh, I'm on BYU TV, it's called Random Acts. It's a TV show where we took a individual who was a quadriplegic, he was a national motivational speaker, and we took him on a shark dive in the Bahamas. Wow. So those are two pieces that haven't quite made our playlist yet, but they are they are out there. And Amazing. we were happy to go to diveheart.org, send something to info, say, hey, Jim, this is my condition. I have ALS. I have a traumatic brain injury. I have spinal cord injury. You know, in addition to I'm on the spectrum, whatever, send that to us and we'll cherry pick some of these stories and send you stuff that will resonate with you and your family. Okay. Uh, Joanne's all over this. She's in the Philly area. Do you have a program anywhere near Philadelphia? We do not have a program in Philadelphia, but we have an awesome ambassador out of Philadelphia. All right. Well, we're going to have to hook her up. He's been on a number of trips with us. His name is uh, Louis Marinucci, and um, and he's on the spectrum, and he is just an amazing ambassador. He dives in the aquarium there in Philadelphia. Not in Philadelphia. No. In New Jersey. He tends to travel. Oh, he travels? So where did he, so if he was in Philadelphia, where did he first go to do your pool program? He actually worked with a, a different um, instructor so that he could get, he actually came to us already cert, scuba certified, okay. but he needed to work with an instructor to kind of do a little refresh. And then he came on one of our trips and uh, dove with us in Cozumel. So I think he's been on three trips now. I think I saw the video with him. He's amazing. Yeah. Louis, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Well, we just so appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Uh, so amazing. I, I hope that everybody will visit diveheart.org, whether you are a person on the spectrum that you want to do this or a differently abled person and you want to, because I saw you guys take people in wheelchairs. You mentioned being a paraplegic, uh, you know, all different kinds of things. But also, if you, you, we're always looking for charities that need donations, what a great thing to donate to. Uh, if you guys have extra money in the couch cushions that you don't have earmarked, donate it to Dive Heart and help somebody to be able to have one of these experiences. It's really amazing. I want to thank you guys for being with us. Is there anything else that we left out that you need to let the folks at home know? Um, no, we're just really excited about some of the things that are going on. Uh, Mayo Clinic has asked us to go with them and present to their uh, their doctors at a conference. And we said, well, where's the conference? And they said, Cozumel, Mexico. So oh, in, in May, perfect. that's our, our next trip out of the country. And we'll be going there and, and bringing our filmmaker who's going to help us capture some great, great footage um, from the doctors about their perspective on, on scuba therapy and their particular discipline in the medical field. So Amazing. we're doing that, yeah, all the time. Yeah, I think um, I, I just want to leave everyone with, you're invited. Yeah. You're invited to come and learn more about us, to talk with us, to um, become a diver if that's what you want, and that's what we can help you with. You're invited. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate your patience too. It's been one of the wonkiest weeks here and I've been in and out not feeling well. So I appreciate your patience. I'm so glad we, we connected and got you on. Yeah. Thank you. Please feel better. I, and, uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> minute by minute. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. You have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Aren't they an inspiration? Uh, absolutely amazing. I love how we, we get the interview one way or the other. Uh, so uh, I, I, absolutely thrilling. Make sure you go to diveheart.org. I was able to watch two of the videos and was so moved uh, by what they're doing. And, uh, you know, not only do, do I, I feel like it goes right to the heart of all the good things in life, people who have a big heart and say, we're going to make it work. We're going to make it work. 
And here are two people that are the perfect example of that. We're going to make it work. You come as you are, you're invited, and we're going to make it work. Uh, truly, truly amazing. But then the benefits are so all over the map. Uh, from hearing about how much self-confidence and independence this young, one young woman was having, but also the sensory of it, uh, you, can't, you can't quantify how much that can add to a person's sense of self, right? Uh, truly, truly inspirational. So we're, we're here at the end of this hour. <laughs> It's been a little up and down for me because I'm still not feeling great, you guys. Uh, but I want to say that tomorrow on the show, we're nothing but pure fun. Uh, Rachel Bird's going to be joining us for Let's Talk All the Things. And uh, she's got a great recipe for you guys that you're absolutely going to love. It's gluten-free, dairy-free. That You know how we talked earlier in the week about maybe you can streamline the morning. She's got a breakfast for you that's super fabulous that you can do at night, streamline that morning thing. Uh, so that'll be wonderful. And we also have a craft for you that you can do with your kiddos that will help you to be organized. And she might have a couple of more things up her sleeves because, you know, she is Martha Stewart in a different pair of Mickey Mouse ears. Uh, so that'll be super fun with her tomorrow. And then, of course, we have stories from the Spectrum on Friday. I also want to reiterate that we, uh, on Monday, are having a very special show. Normally, Monday is reserved for parent to parent. But on Monday, we are having the two dads from the Just Two Dads podcast that are going to be with us. They're amazing. I'm so excited that we get to meet them in person. They're going to be here in the studio. It is possible that we are also going to have Dr. Doreen for that show. Uh, but it is equally possible that we won't. You know how that goes. So, but we will have Dr. Doreen on Tuesday of next week, and then we've got great programming for you for the next couple of months. But I also, I don't want to leave without talking about the Autism Network Podcast-a-thon, which is going to start on April 4th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we are going to make the attempt to stay on the air live, nonstop, for 44 hours. And people are saying to me, why 44? Well, the, the current CDC numbers are 1 in 44. Do we believe that they're going to change between now and then? Yes, but we have to make a plan now. So it's 1 in 44, so we are going to do 44 hours live. And I am so excited by some of the people that we're lining up. I told you this morning uh, that we have a definitive time that we're going to have Dr. Grandin on. She'll be on at 7 p.m. Pacific time, so that's 10 p.m. Eastern time. We wanted it to be in within those prime time hours for as many time zones as we possibly could in the United States. My apologies to those of you overseas, but... Wait till you see what we're packing the hours with for you, those of you that are in Dubai and Australia and in Europe. Where I know many of you say, "Ah, oh, I never get to watch you live." Well, you will now. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go almost around the clock twice before we stop. So we'll start at three o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, and we'll stop at I think eleven o'clock on Thursday. Yes, I'm just going to move in a mattress uh, in here so I can take naps from time to time. And we will have uh, guest takeovers from podcasts that we love and from charities that we love that will take over for the hour and provide programming uh, during that hour for themselves. So that's coming up. That is the Autism Network Podcast-a-thon April 4th through the 6th uh, of April. Okay, uh, we have just a couple of minutes left here, and so I didn't have anything planned in particular that I wanted to talk about. Anybody have a quick question that they want to write in really quickly uh, before we leave this? Again, just while I'm waiting to see if somebody has a quick question, we never have this, right, with a quick question. Uh, again, tomorrow, let's talk all the things with Rachel Bird, Friday, Stories from the Spectrum. And I will say this, um, if you know someone that you love that's on the autism spectrum and you've seen stories from the spectrum and you think, I, I think that this individual has a story to tell, please reach out to us. We are always looking for artists that we want to invest in to have their stories told in stories from the spectrum. So I'm not seeing a question from anybody. Uh, I, I may actually end a minute early. 
because I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the struggle bus. For the, <laughs> I have had this sinus thing on this eye. The eye is puffy. I have just had a week, uh, and I am on the struggle bus. But uh, it doesn't change the fact that I love and admire and respect and adore all of you. I'm always so thrilled to have the opportunity to be here with all of you, and uh, I'm just throwing my loving arms around you for all the work that you guys are doing in your lives and putting forth the message that individuals on the autism spectrum are amazing and deserve opportunity and dignity and love and respect, yeah? All right, uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>